Today, if you'll open your Bibles again to Matthew chapter 6, we're going to continue our study of the Lord's pattern for prayer. Now, last week, in just the phrase, our Father in heaven, Jesus taught us three critical truths about God's nature, our relationship to Him, and how we are to approach Him when we pray. The word our reveals the centrality of community. The word father, the primacy of love. And in heaven, the reality of the spiritual realm. Jesus said, when we pray to him, we must first be mindful of all God's family. Secondly, we are to recognize the shocking privilege it is that to all who received him, who believed in his name, to these he gave the right to become children of God. And thirdly, we must remember that our Father in heaven is not like our earthly fathers in any way limited by time, space, or the finite resources of this world. Well, with those three principles just kind of locked in from the first phrase of that prayer, Jesus proceeds and he reveals to us that the priority of all prayer is that we would perceive and pursue and praise and proclaim God's holiness. So Jesus said this, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now, the Lord's Prayer contains six specific petitions or, or requests from God. But Jesus directs us to begin our prayers. The first petition is to express our concern for the glory of God. Remember, he's already warned us not to pray with any vain repetition. So we must always guard that our hallowing of his name is not just some kind of meaningless flattery that we offer him before we get to our real agenda. But always the first priority of prayer is God's majesty, God's glory, God's holiness. We are asking him to put that on display. And so the lesson of the first petition is this. Always take care of the thy before you go to the my. That's a good principle to remember. Our Father will give to us, forgive us, lead us, and deliver us after we have hallowed his name, brought his kingdom, and submitted ourselves to his will. Now, in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus said, Not a sparrow falls from the sky without the Father's notice. John MacArthur notes that Jesus spoke Aramaic, and the Aramaic, Aramaic word that is translated by the Greek word and then into English, fall, it literally means not to fall, but to hop. And see, it, it's not just that the Father knows when a sparrow dies. That's not what Jesus was saying. But rather that the Father sees every sparrow's hop. And friends, if God is as attentive to the sparrows, he knows our needs. And so when it comes to our petitions to him, we don't have to do a bunch of religious gyrations like the prophets of Baal did in their contest with Elijah. Our God cares deeply about us. He is our Father, and our God does not sleep. We don't need to flatter him with shallow praise before we make our request. The truth is, God is just as offended by that kind of emotional manipulation as we are when people try to do it to us. But Jesus says here, when you pray to our Father in heaven, the King of glory, begin by expressing your own genuine heartfelt concern for his glory and for his agenda. Now, what I want us to do now is just to consider the language of this first petition. In the ancient world, names, and we've talked about this a couple of times the last few weeks, names were very, very important. They were way more than mere titles. One's name represented one's authority. One's name represented one's character. Everything one was was in the name of a person. To act in the name of another was to act in accordance with that other person's values, purposes, and power. To name something was to demonstrate your authority over it. Parents named their own children. Adam was called by God to name all the animals of creation because he was to be their master there in the garden. But no man ever gave a name to God. No man ever named God. Every name that is revealed to us in Scripture of God God is the one who revealed it 
to men because no one has authority. No one is master of God. Each name of God reveals to us some unique and important aspect of who he is and what he wants to do in our life. Now, you know, we have Ten Commandments, which kind of encapsulates the law of God. And the third of those commandments is that we are never to use the name of the Lord, the name of God in vain. But in their legalistic obsession with that commandment, the Jews, especially in Jesus' day, they kind of totally missed the point of the commandment. God wanted all of his creation not to revere uh, just what he was called, not to revere his title, but to revere all that he was. Now, God first revealed his name to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, as Yahweh. That was the name God revealed, which roughly translated is, I am that I am, Yahweh. To respect that name, the Jews would never speak it. They didn't want to break that third commandment, so they would never ever say that name of God out loud. And the truth is they were hesitant to even write it when they were recording or copying scriptures or talking about God. So whenever they came to the name Yahweh that is represented by four consonants in the Hebrew language, when they were reading scripture out loud, they would substitute the word Adonai, which means Lord. Now, this is a little vague, and there's some controversy about it, but I, I believe that later Jewish scholars came along and invented a new word, uh, another word to substitute for Yahweh besides Adonai. And that word is the word, it's come to us through the Latin as Jehovah. Jehovah was allegedly formed by some Jewish scholars combining the consonants of Yahweh with the vowels of Adonai. But you see, the goal of this third commandment, to not take the Lord's name in vain, it was never that God's people would fear to speak his name. God's goal was that we would all revere his name and that we would all honor all that that name represents. In Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, Moses began, the Lord, the Lord. And I want you to notice uh, on the text uh, on the screen that the, the word Lord is spelled here with all capital letters. And if you look at your Bible in Exodus 34, 6, you'll find that it's spelled with all capital letters. Whenever you're reading in your Old Testament and you see in your English Bible the word Lord with all capital letters, you know that behind that word, behind that English word is the Hebrew word Yahweh. That is literally the name of God as he revealed it to Moses. But if you're reading the Old Testament and you see the word Lord with a capital L because it refers to God, but it has a small O-R-D, then behind that word is the Hebrew word Adonai, which is not the name of God, but it is a title attributed to God. So here in Exodus 34, 6, Moses literally calls God's name. He says, Yahweh, Yahweh. And then he describes what that name means. A God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Notice that description is not of the four consonants, the four letters, but of the character of the name. He's not describing the name of God by which he's called. He's describing all that that name represents. In Psalms chapter 9, verse 10, it says, those who know your name, oh God, those who know your name, they put their trust in you. Well, that isn't saying that everyone who learns the name Yahweh is going to automatically put their trust in God. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that all of those who know Everything your name stands for and represents, those are the ones. Because they know what that name means. They're going to trust in you. In Psalm 7, uh, 17, it says, I will give to the Lord the thanks that is due his righteousness. And I will sing praise to the name of the Lord, the Most High. Well, the psalmist isn't saying there that we should all be singing praises to the word Yahweh because it's a really cool word but rather that we should be praising the name Yahweh because of all that it represents, because of all that that name describes. So Jesus said, when you pray, when you pray, say, Our Father 
who loves us and who is in heaven and has all the supplies to meet all of our needs, may your identity, may your nature, your character, your attributes, your reputation, may your name, may the holiness of it, the hallowedness of it, be recognized by all. That's what Jesus was saying when he taught us to pray, hallowed be thy name. I told you that every Bible name of God was revealed by God, and it reveals to us some aspect of his character, some aspect of who he is. He is called in Scripture Elohim, the creator. He is El Elyon, the possessor of heaven and earth. He is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. He is Jehovah Nissi, the Lord, our banner. He is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. He is Jehovah Shalom, the Lord, our peace. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, uh, Ra, the Lord, our shepherd. He is Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord, our righteousness. Jehovah Sabbath, the Lord of hosts. He is Jehovah Mekodeshkim, the Lord who sanctifies. He is Jehovah Shama, the Lord who is near or close. But you know what the most amazing name, the most revealing name of God that is given to us in Scripture? This is the best name for God. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. Because He is the Lord. He is Master. He is Yeshua, Jesus. He is the Savior of His people. And He is Christ. He is the King of kings. Think of the names that Jesus drew to Himself in the New Testament. He is called Jesus the bread of life, the living water, the way, the truth, the life. He is the resurrection. He is the good shepherd. He's the branch, the bright and morning star. He is the lamb of God. He is the rose of Sharon. He's the lily of the valley. He is the door through which all men must pass. And what's interesting about Jesus is hundreds of years before he was even born, the prophet Isaiah gave him some other names. He is wonderful counselor, mighty God, prince of peace, everlasting father. As Christians, we are taught and, and we are taught in scripture and it is right that we are taught to pray in the name of Jesus. And most of us close our prayers by saying in the name of Jesus, amen. But you know, when you say in the name of Jesus, all oh men, at the end of your prayers, that's not like adding a postage stamp or making sure the zip code's right before you mail a letter. To pray in the name of Jesus is to say, Lord, I ask this, this thing I have just prayed to you about, I ask these things because I know this is totally consistent with your character and your will. That's what it means to pray in the name of Jesus. And friends, frankly, to ever say in the name of Jesus at the end of your prayers, when you don't know that everything you just asked for is consistent with his will, that is to take the Lord's name in vain. In fact, it's to do so far more than any curse word. So to begin a prayer by asking God to hallow his name is the same as asking God to help us to only think and only feel and only pray in accordance with who Jesus is and what Jesus would want in the name of Jesus. Now, what exactly does this word hallow mean? Well, some of the newer versions translate the word holy. Uh, hallow and holy are the same thing. We translate the root word of both of those words, hagios, as holy, Sometimes in your Bible, it will say holy. Sometimes it'll say hallow. Sometimes it will say separated. Sometimes that word is translated to be sanctified. But to holy, to, to, to be holy or hollow is to describe something that is absolutely pure, absolutely distinctive, that is separated from all other things. And the thing is, as only Jehovah God is truly holy, the word holy has come to describe only and all things that are uniquely associated with God himself. The temple was a holy place. Why? Because it was set apart. It was a unique place where God was to be worshipped. 
The Israelites were to be a separate or holy people because they were called out of all the nations to a unique relationship with God and to a unique mission for God. Among Israel, the Levites, the tribe of Levi, they were holy, they were distinctive, they were separated from the other people because they were called by God to distinctive service. They would be the ones to touch the holy things in the holy place so that the holy people could worship. And all Christians today, the church has been told to come out of the world, to be holy, to be separated from the world, and to become this holy, and here's the King James translation, to be a peculiar people. I know some of you say, well, I got that part right, but that peculiar means to be separate for God, for His purpose, peculiar to the world, because you are all about God. God Himself, the Bible says He is holy, holy, holy. There is none like him. And so to hallow his name is just to confess that. And friends, I, I want to tell you, this is, the, this is the balancing principle to last week's sermon. You see, the one true creator God to whom all men will someday give an account is indeed a holy God. And that truth, that truth that he is not like anyone else, that he is absolutely pure, absolutely perfect, absolutely consistent, absolutely righteous, that he is a holy God, one who's, who's by his very nature, his holy wrath is kindled against all of the unrighteousness and the sin of men and those who suppress the truth. Because that's who he is. That's the truth that makes it so amazing that all of us sinners falling short of his glory could ever possibly call him our Abba. Now, God's people, we have always struggled. We have always struggled to hold those two truths about the nature of God, that he is holy and that he is also our Father, the holiness of God and the fatherhood of God. We've always struggled to hold on to both of those things and to, and to hold them in balance the way Scripture presents them. You know, a lot long ago when most people in the church and, and certainly even in most people in the culture, even people that didn't go to church, but when they thought about God and they thought about the God of Scripture, they thought about the God of the Bible, they had the same response. It filled their heart with a holy fear because he was a holy God and they understood that. But I have to tell you, I, I think this era of history has clearly passed and many, many people today have sit in church all their lives and they've never heard a sermon on the holiness of God, much less a call to holiness themselves if they're going to serve Him. They've not contemplated the all-consuming, wrathful judgment which the Word of God assures us Jesus Himself is going to pour out upon mankind as He returns. Most churches today have abandoned any pursuit of, of the biblical mandates that are given to the church in Scripture. Uh, they're pretty simple. We are to evangelize the lost. We are to edify the saints. And we are to gather. And, you know, the word gather, assemble, is actually what the word church means. Literally, that's what the word means, to come out of the world and gather a special assembly, a special gathering. But we gather for the express purpose to become God's holy temple. And that is what we are. Each of us a brick in that temple, the mystical temple of God. And we don't just be the temple. We then offer as his people and the temple in our gathering, we offer him a liturgy. That's a word that means service of worship. A liturgy. We give it to God. It's our gift to him. We have a service of worship that is given to him by his people. It's a special thing when the church comes together to give to our God a service of worship. And it, it, is, it would be funny if it wasn't so sad, but it's a sad fact that most churchgoers today somehow have got all this corrupt in their mind. They don't understand this basic 101 Christian principle. And they've got the idea, the ridiculous idea that the purpose of a church gathering, the purpose of a worship service is to somehow serve them. 
They think it's for them. And, and, and you who are watching at home, some of you think, well, this service is for you, so you'll be blessed there in your home. But it's not. Worship service is not about you. It's not about man. That's not the purpose of it. In our self-styled Christianity, in our self-styled, self-invented churches, very few feel any deep duty to evangelize or to edify the saints, which is what we're all to be doing all the time, much less to gather for a special service of worship, to become the temple of God where He will be present and where He is honored in praise. This is why people today, they, they don't think twice about skipping out on a Lord's Day assembly of the church. And even when we do show up, too often we enter in such a way, we enter the sacred assembly of God's people. We enter His presence because when two or three are gathered together, He is there. We enter that presence and the way we enter reveals an utter ignorance of God, of who God, this Hebrew calls him, the consuming fire is, and how we ought to act in his presence. Friends, listen to me. You do not approach the holy king of kings fearlessly. You do not approach him habitually late. You do not enter his presence casually with your donuts and latte in hand. When we do that, it reveals something that we don't understand who he is and what we are called to do here. During this time of crisis, the technology that has enabled all of us, and especially the most vulnerable among us, to, to stay home when we could not gather, to stay connected to the body of Christ, that technology has been a wonderful blessing. And... Uh, I thank God for it. I thank God that I was able to continue my ministry during the shutdown through the technology. But I have to tell you that I fear it is now something that the devil's using to accelerate the pruning of the church, which I see taking place. The separation within the church of those who live to serve the Lord and those who really in their heart of hearts believe that the God of heaven exists to serve them. And those are two different perspectives of God. One goes to the worship service to offer the Lord the service of worship. The other goes to be served. Now I want you to understand something. I, I know that God today and, and never has been concerned with the externals of worship. And so whether you are home or whether you are in one of our buildings today, uh, those externals, where your body is, what your body position is. We talked about this last week with prayer, all the externals, the order of worship, the liturgy, the things. I mean, there's things he's commanded us to do, but he's not so much concerned with how loud you sing. He's not so much concerned with the externals of the event in the past, many Christians, like the Pharisees in Jesus' day, they, they pridefully thought that their externals, that their, their compliance to the ritual somehow made them holy and acceptable in the sight of God. But today, I worry about the flippancy and the shallowness of the modern church. I worry that we are exhibiting externals that are communicating the wrong things to our children about the priority of God and his place in our life. What are your externals teaching your children? What do you do on the Lord's day that they see? What do you do that the Lord's people see, that your neighbors see? Even more so, I think that our externals are perhaps revealing thinking and heart toward God that's just inappropriate. Friends, he is our heavenly father. He is. He wants to be, but his name is to be hallowed for he is the thrice holy eternal judge of both the living and the dead. And always, always when we approach him, we must do so with great reverence and fear. We must begin our prayers by hallowing his name. The God to whom we sing praises today the God whose word we now study and hopefully we are submitting ourselves. We're planning to respond to what we're learning. 
that same God did not allow Moses, his faithful servant and friend, to enter into the promised land. You know why? Because in one day, in one fit of anger, Moses, here's what the Bible says, failed to treat God as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel. Well, the holiness of God is a serious matter. He failed to hallow his name. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 9, God's chosen king grew impatient when God's chosen prophet showed up late to the pre-battle sacrifice. And so King Saul presumed, he took it upon himself to change the order of worship a little bit, to do things a little different. And he went and did what God had specifically said only a priest can do. And because he did not hallow God's name, his service to God as king was terminated. In 2 Samuel 6, the Ark of the Covenant, the ultimate symbol of God's holiness and presence, it had been captured by the Philistines. But on this particular day, it was finally being returned to its rightful place in Jerusalem in the center of God's people. Well, God had given very specific instructions in his word on how this symbol of his holiness, the symbol of his presence was to be handled and transported by men. No man was to ever touch the ark. There were rings built into the side where carrying poles set, and he was only to be carried by those poles. And it was only to be transported on the shoulders of sanctified holy priests. They went through a whole sanctification ceremony, and they put on their holy robes, and then those men carried the ark. That's the only way it was to be moved. Now, I don't know why, for some reason, maybe it was just a hassle. Maybe they didn't have enough priests. Maybe they didn't have their robes. I, I don't know why. But for some reason, God's people just ignored the instructions on how they were to transport the ark that were clearly given in the word. They did not take the holiness of God seriously. And they stuck the ark on an ox cart. Well, they began to move and the ox stumbled and the ark began to literally fall to the ground. And one man in the crowd, a man named Musa, no doubt with good intentions, he ran up and put his hands on the ark to steady the ark. But God immediately struck him dead. You see, friends, going to church or having good intentions in your heart in no way compensates for a willful neglect and disobedience to the word of God or to a casual disregard for what God has said, for the holiness of God. In 2 Chronicles 26, King Uzziah, he entered the temple and decided to burn incense to God, but it was an affront to God's holiness, and so God struck him with leprosy. In Acts chapter 5 in the New Testament, Ananias and Sapphira, they lied to the Holy Spirit and the apostles and the church about how much money they'd given, and God struck them both dead, and the result was the whole church was caused to fear I, I would think that would be true, right? You get the reputation, hey, don't, don't mess around at that church because God will come down and strike you dead. In 1 Corinthians, some of the church in Corinth were coming every week and partaking of the communion in an unworthy manner. They weren't seen through to the broken body and shed blood of Christ. And, and God was sickened by it. And he came down and he caused some in the church to become physically sick and some of them to die. Because their flippancy with the communion service. Friends, God is serious about his word. He's serious about his holiness. And while it is totally essential that we all come to know him as Abba, it is equally essential that we never ever forget that he is the holy God of heaven. And we are all sinners falling short of his glory. And we breathe today only by his unending mercy an amazing grace. Proverbs 23, 17 says, always be zealous for the fear of the Lord. You need to chase after, you need to pursue, you need to always have at the forefront of your mind the fear of the Lord. The Hebrew word for fear, Yahweh, carries the idea of great honor and reverence and respect. Solomon in Proverbs uses the word 18 times because Yahweh, this great Fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of knowledge. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus told us, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, you be afraid of the one 
who can destroy both soul and body in hell. That's whom you should have continual fear. In 1 Peter 2.17, it kind of sums up all the duties of Christians everywhere. Here's, here it is. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Friends, that's your Christian duty. Number three, what exactly does living out this first petition of hallowing God's name, what does it look like? How do we, how do we hallow the name of God? Well, it's, it's a little funny phrase for us because the name of God is holy. It is hallowed whether or not we do anything and whether or not we even recognize it as being so. It is what it is. But we can hallow, we can recognize the holiness of God's name by just recognizing all that he is and attributing that to him. We glorify God when we see and when we extol the glory he manifests. We hallow him when we see and we extol the holiness that is his. Now, there's two essential steps to this. There's two essential steps to recognizing God's holiness. Step number one is pretty easy. It is simply, it's easy to say, sometimes harder to do, but it, it, it means to simply live, live your life moment by moment, day by day, with a constant awareness of his presence. Don't ever forget that God is with you, that he is all around you, and you acknowledge the reality of his existence. That's step one to Halloween, the name of God, is never forget that he's here. He's here this morning. He's here with every one of God's people wherever we are in the city today. Hebrews chapter 11 says, he who comes to God must believe that he is. That's the beginning. You know, Pastor Philip Brooks is famous for writing a, a Christmas carol that's a favorite of many. The name of the carol is A Little Town of Bethlehem. You guys know that carol. But Philip Brooks was also the pastor that the famous school teacher, Ann Sullivan, brought in to share all about God with her most famous pupil, Helen Keller. Now, Brooks and Helen Keller became lifelong friends, and many of their personal letters have been published. And in one of her letters, Helen Keller told Pastor Brooks that she had always known about God, even before she even had any words even before she could call God anything, she said she was aware of him. For her, nothing included God, nothing in, in, including God had a name. She didn't know how to call anything anything. She, she had trouble distinguishing. She didn't have names for anything. She didn't understand the concept of names. But in this existence she had in her total darkness and total isolation, she said she always knew that she was not alone. Something was with her. She felt God's presence and she felt God's love for her. And when she was given through her teacher the gift of language and was able to put a name on things and distinguish between things, and when Pastor Brooks came and told her all about God, you know what she said? She said, I already knew. I already knew. It is speculated that Phillips Brooks had Helen Keller in mind when he wrote his famous third stanza of his Christmas carol. How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessing of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin where meek souls will receive him, still the dear Christ enters in. Friend, hallowing God's name begins with just recognizing, as Helen Keller did, that I am is I am. Recognizing his presence. But here's step two. We must understand him. We must think of him as he has revealed himself to us. Helen Keller knew that she was not alone in the world, but she could not begin to know the character and the personality and the activity and the agenda and all that God had done for her. She could not begin to know all of those things until the man of God came and shared with her the word of God. Now, this is really, we talked about the third commandment. This is really all about the second commandment, about idolatry. We are never 
ever in our lives to kind of invent a personality or project something that we want to be true and attribute that to God. We're not to do that. That is idolatry. For you to say, well, I think God is, that's idolatry. Don't ever do that. We are to instead listen and hear his word. And then we are to worship God as he has chosen to reveal himself to us. Very practically, this is why in my daily quiet time, in my prayer time, I I always want to read some scripture before I pray. Because all scripture is God-breathed, and all scripture reveals who God is. After understanding who God is, the kinds of things he's done, the kinds of things he cares about, the commands he's given, after understanding the revealed truth of God, I can then hallow God in my prayers by reciting back to him that which he's revealed. I can say, God, your word has revealed to me today about your power or about your love or about your mercy. And Lord, I see in these Bible stories and I can see how you are manifesting all of these qualities and attributes in my life right now in these things. You see, that is hallowing his name, recognizing all that he is and all that name represents. But it is not enough for us just to recognize all that God is. You see, ultimately, we hallow God's name by resolving to be like him. We do that for his name's sake. Martin Luther asked in his catechism, what is God's name, excuse me, how is God's name hallowed amongst us? Then he answered the question, when both our doctrines and our living are truly Christian. You know, one thing I learned very early growing up in a parsonage is that fairly or unfairly as a kid, everything I did ended up reflecting on my father. Some people blame my father for it, right? It, good and bad. It all went to him, fair or unfair. I, Dad got blamed for, for the things I did. And I think we all do this a little bit. It's not a good thing to do. It's not something that we should be proud of. But, you know, every time a teenager gets in trouble, fairly or unfairly, someone questions the parenting. That's just kind of the way family works. And when we become children of God and we begin to call call God our Father, all of our actions reflect on His name. Everything we say and we do, fairly or unfairly, it brings honor or it brings shame to his name. So friends, the best way that you and I can hallow the name of God is by just following closely after Jesus, imitating Jesus. And as we surrender ourselves to the hallowing or the sanctifying work of his Holy Spirit, his fruit, the manifestations of his character will begin to grow in us. And when the world begins to see in us his character, God receives his glory. Again, God is holy. His name is hallowed whether or not we recognize it. And, and, and so when we pray, hallowed be the name, we're not asking God to do something that uh, he already is. We are asking him to put himself on display. We are asking him to let men see and let men know about his holiness. And of course, he wants that to begin in us as we become his image bearers. 1,700 years ago, Gregory of Nassa prayed, may I become through thy help blameless, just, and holy. May I abstain from every evil, speak the truth, and do justly. May I walk in the straight paths, shining with temperance, adorned with incorruption, beautiful through wisdom and prudence. May I meditate upon the things that are above and despise what is earthly, For a man can glorify God in no other way save by his virtue, which bears witness that the divine power is the cause of all his goodness. Friends, that is how you and I can hallow the name of God in our prayers. Father, we thank you so much for our time together and our time of study. And we thank you, Lord, for your word and we thank you, Lord, for your spirit, which, which helps us understand the word and helps us to apply the word. And Lord, convicts us when we stray from the word. And I pray, Father, today that you would make us a people with a, a heart that hungers for you and desires to put your glory on display. 
And I pray, Lord, your spirit would do a work in our life that you would convict us, you would encourage us, you would challenge us that we might show the world a better picture of Jesus so that he might receive his glory, so his name might be hallowed. In Jesus' name we pray these things.